Hello everyone, welcome back to Lies, the bit of extra history where I get to gab about all the things that we didn't have time to include, and uh, fess up to all the things we got wrong. As always, we struggled a bit with pronunciation, mfkane should be mfkane, not mfkane, uh, actually that's even wrong, the C should be a clicking noise, which I literally cannot make no matter how long I sit here trying to practice it, so just know we got that wrong, 100% my fault. Um, Boer should be boar and not boar, uh, and I think we probably screwed up a ton of other stuff. I'm sorry, we tried as best we could, we looked up stuff wherever we could, and we still got it wrong. Then there's the outright lies, which I think we only did one of. Uh, if you're watching really carefully, you'll notice that in episode 3 at about the 50 second mark, we're using the Dutch flag that we used throughout the whole piece. But, at that particular time, we're talking about the Dutch in 1652. So the blue bar on the flag should be a lot lighter, and the red bar should maybe be orange. Uh, the dark blue came in after the French took over because during the French Revolution, they wanted to make the French flag and the Dutch flag more similar. Uh, and while the official flag of the Dutch Republic used red, Many people, especially in South Africa, flew what is known as the Prince's Flag, which originated when the House of Orange rose up in rebellion against the Spanish Habsburgs, and so they had an orange stripe instead of the red one. That flag was considered a symbol of Dutch nationalism and thus outlawed by the French, and so the flag you see throughout this thing... But you can see how long it took me to explain that, and we decided it would be too confusing to show a flag we'd never shown before without any context for one single image, so we didn't. My fault. And lastly, this one is actually bad. I wrote the Battle of Bloody River instead of the Battle of Blood River and never caught it. And this is important because the Battle of Blood River actually plays a huge part in the cultural history of South Africa. Because before the Battle of Blood River, the Boer commandos made a vow that if God would grant them victory, uh, they and all future generations would celebrate the day as a holy day and they would build a church in honor of that vow. This sort of grew into a legend, and some later Boers used it to support the idea that God had granted them South Africa. This, of course, became mixed with racial segregation and was used by some as a justification for apartheid. This, though, actually ends on a more positive ending, because now the day is celebrated as the Day of Reconciliation, and intended to foster unity, then continue long-standing divides. I also want to give a clarification. We refer to the Dutch who moved inland as Boers rather than Voortrekkers because that's what they would have called themselves. Voortrekker is actually a later term, which means the people who first moved, which of course the people moving at the time didn't call themselves. And on another note, you probably heard De Beers ads for diamonds. Uh, they were founded in that diamond rush we talked about. And if you want to talk about monopolies and shady business dealings, you should dive down that rabbit hole. Uh, they took a very active role in the Boer War, tried to evade U.S. monopoly laws, they invented the phrase, diamonds are forever. I mean, heck, the reason that we think of diamonds when we think of wedding and engagement rings is actually solely because of the beer's marketing. And that reminds me, a couple of clarifications I want to do for this series. Uh, in the first episode, the few people got confused about how the Zulus got maize, as it's not a local crop. Uh, Europeans brought it over in the 1600s, but by the time our story starts, basically the whole Zulu economy had switched over to maize because it's a much more efficient crop. Which was great! But it's also much more water intensive than the local plants. So when the drought hit, destabilization plus plus. Also, a lot of people wondered about slavery and its role in these events, and truth is, while it's indubitably an important and terrible part of South African history, it didn't have a huge impact on the events that we're talking about. I guess I'm going to dive in a little bit more in depth here because it's something we should talk about, and the slave trade is actually probably something we should eventually do a whole series on. Uh, but when I think of slave trade in Africa, and usually I think when we talk about the slave trade in Africa, what we're really talking about is something called the triangle trade. This was a system where manufactured goods from Europe were brought to the west coast of Africa to trade for slaves, which were then exchanged for in the Americas for raw materials to bring back to Europe. And the tragic truth is that it was much more convenient for pe to ship people from coastal West Africa to the Americas than it was to go all the way to South Africa. So that's where the vast majority of the slave trade occurred, in West Africa. 
Some slaves were exported from South Africa to the Asian and Pacific Islands, but surprisingly, so far as I can tell, it looks like South Africa was actually more of an importer of slaves. Uh, as South Africa was more of a true colony with people moving in and settling and setting up farms than many of the other African nations, there was a greater need for cheap labor internally. And the Dutch East India Company outlawed the taking of local slaves, which meant that South Africa largely imported its slave population. So despite slavery being a huge, important part of South African history, it doesn't have too much of a direct impact on our story. The one area it actually does come in is the fact that shortly after the British took over, they abolished slavery, which was one of the complaints the Dutch settlers had, which caused them to try and move out beyond British control. Okay, so now that we've taken care of the heavy stuff, let's get on to some trivia. First off, in episode four, when an eclipse occurred at the height of the battle, that really happened. You'd be surprised how many of these tiny things that are in these episodes are actually part of the historical record. It's not to say you shouldn't double check me on this stuff because one of the reasons we do this episode is to point out that it's imperative that we learn from history, but that no single historical account is ever gonna be the total truth. You should always get a second viewpoint. But where I have them, I try and throw in tiny neat details. Next, did you know Lord Carnarvon was known as Twitters because he was so twitchy? Uh, it doesn't seem like he got a lot of respect. Also, most of the pictures we have of Chetswayo are of him in a business suit. This is of course because while a few pictures are taken of him while he was in Africa, many more were taken of him when he went to England. Um, oh, and remember how this whole thing was sort of kicked off by the French taking over the Netherlands during the French Revolution? Well, in an odd twist of fate, the last real heir to the house of Bonaparte and to the French throne was actually killed by the Zulus in the Anglo-Zulu War. Uh, Napoleon IV was living in quasi-exile in England after the disastrous Franco-Prussian War which ended the Second French Empire, and he actually held a largely honorary post in the English army. But when the Anglo-Zulu War broke out, he pressured the British government to let him join. With many reservations, the government of England finally said, okay, you can go, but gave special instructions to Chelmsford to make sure that uh, Bonaparte survived the conflict. He didn't. He died on a scouting mission he shouldn't have even been on where he sort of commandeered the command. And all of Europe was shocked. This was the last hope for a restoration of the Bonapartist monarchy. And here it was by this African tribe snuffed out. Uh, or there's a great quote from the, from the words of the British Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli. Uh, he said upon hearing this, he said of the Zulus, that they are a very remarkable people, the Zulus. They defeat our generals, they convert our bishops, and they have settled the fate of a great European dynasty. Oh, and a number of people question why the Zulu Empire is called an empire if it's only the size of New Jersey. We have come to use the term empire broadly to mean any big thing from a business empire to a political one, but usually uh, when I hear it, it's a little more formally defined as any ethnically or linguistically diverse groups ruled by a central authority. Uh, you can also add without the ability to opt out of that rulership to separate it from a confederation but under that definition the zulu empire is definitely an empire and that's what's going on most of the time when you hear small territories referred to as empires uh, either that or their monikers simply declared themselves an emperor all right i'm trying to keep this a lot shorter than the last time i know i went overboard with the walpole facts and actually there's a few more i wanted to throw in this one but uh, there's one other big thing which I really wanted to address, so we'll skip those and we'll talk about the question of bullhorn tactics. Uh, many people ask how it was possible that what seems like basic military tactics to us could be an innovation in the 19th century. Uh, here's how I see it. Low harm warfare is actually fairly common in societies with pre-Bronze Age economic output. And this makes a lot of sense. When your society is functioning basically on a subsistence level and food production is a massively labor intensive work you don't want to suddenly drastically reduce your workforce. And in places where the odds of surviving to adulthood were comparatively low, it could be disastrous if you just wiped out a large segment of your adult men over some minor land dispute. In fact, in these societies, the additional labor force was actually probably more valuable than the land. This means that such societies aren't really motivated to create violent intensive forms of warfare. And it's probably up for debate as to whether or not they 
had the excess labor capacity to dedicate time and energy to sort of the drill required for even the most rudimentary tactics. But with the introduction of European crops and the additional economic driver of European trade, the indigenous people of South Africa suddenly came to have a population surplus. And when you have that type of surplus, the land value and the value of goods goes up. And unfortunately, the value of lives goes down. And this means that you could finally dedicate more time to drill and military structure. And it meant finally they had a reason to really fight over territory. After all, territory just isn't as valuable if you don't have the people to work it. Which, to me, inevitably leads to the creation of tactics. But that's just how I read it. Um, it's awesome people are asking, though, as working through the whys, even if we don't always have the answer, is, to me, one of the most important parts of history. One other thing I forgot to mention, uh, and then I promise I'll wrap this up, but I've got to talk about our musicians. A few weeks ago, we put up our next Patreon stretch goal, getting musicians for the show, which I was super excited about. But what was amazing is shortly after we put it up, we got an email from two brothers who had worked on Hell on Wheels and the Clone Wars TV show and a bunch of stuff. And they just offered to make music for the show until we crossed the Patreon threshold. So I want to give a big thanks to Sean and Dean Kinner um, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. I might have butchered your names. I'm sorry. Uh, I look forward to the day we can pay you guys what you're worth. But I should wrap this up. So thank you all for watching, and I hope you'll join us next week as we dive into one of the most remarkable reigns in Roman history, the reign of Justinian Theodora.